This episode is sponsored by Artlist. Enjoy the silky smooth beats on our videos? We recently switched over to Artlist for our channel music and we've never looked back. They have an awesome selection of beats that's way more in tune with my tastes and it's wicked that you can filter out tracks that have vocals. Super helpful for any of you creators also in the YouTube game. They've given me a special deal for you guys today, two months free when you grab an annual plan, link in the description below. I've not had any content strikes so far with Artlist, so totally worth it. So this image here was actually a series from a series of images that I shot at a historic mansion in York to give us access to the mansion. So I went in and location scouted and I got some models together. We got some makeup artists and hairstylists and costume designers. And then we all came together to do this shoot. So this is the owl lady from that shoot. Um, as you can see, I'm quitting out one of the owls now very roughly in, okay uh, and was this a personal project or was it done as like a client commission uh this was a, a it was kind of a collaborative personal project with, and when it, you with, say with, collaborative with the with venue the costu- yeah with the venue with the costume designers and the makeup artists and the models okay that's cool and can you tell me a bit about your approach to fantasy art because your fantasy art looks a bit different to the other fantasy art that we see on youtube yeah, I tend to I tend to veer to, more towards fantasy realism. Like I do like surreal fantasy, but for me, if it's too surreal, it just takes me out of the image. So I kind of I like to have a realism image because it grounds the image. And if, if it's if the image is grounded, it's just more realistic. For Absolutely. example, this image this image here. Uh, obviously, there's some surreal aspects to it, but it's not completely surreal. Where you're just like, this, this is ludicrous. This would yeah. never happen in the real world or in a movie. <laughs> okay, that's cool. Yeah. Because when I first saw this um, artwork and time lapse, I thought, well, this really goes over the fundamentals of compositing, stock matching, and lighting. And I thought it'd be great to do a breakdown because most people try and jump in and do fantasy artwork like phase runner or benny productions Mm -hmm. right out the gate without learning the fundamentals of compositing and color and light matching so throughout this video if i'm correct you're going to be demonstrating and explaining to the newbies how to match these elements yeah so basically i i totally agree with what you're saying like with anything in life, you have to know and learn and and be able to be good at the fundamentals before you move on to the more ad- advanced things. Yep. And it's like that with anything. And with fundamentals, I would say, is like yeah, matching your tone, matching your colours, um, making sure that the angles and the lights uh, are all the same, and just making a scene look real. Because if you if you took a photo of it, would it look like that uh, on your screen? So, for example, here I'm adding the shadow under the owl. Obviously, yep. there's something on top of another surface. There's going to be a bit of a shadow. And another way to go even further into that is the color of the shadow. Some people will just paint black onto the yep. arm or onto the floor. Which is when... a big no-no. Yeah. So, a shadow will have the color of the surroundings in it. Like, if you have a white ball, you put it near grass, it's got like a green kind of reflective color on top of it. And it's the same with shadow. A little bit, the shadow will be like the an a, amalgamation of all the darks in the image. So the color. So like if you look in the right in the very back, that's probably the darkest part of the image. But it will still have a maybe like a tint of blue in it. Okay. And how do you color that shadow? Because me, I'm I'm just using exposure now, and that I'm assuming works with the color information that's already in the scene. But how? What? What's your? Um, approach I use curves. To doing that? So I use pretty much use. If anyone goes through my workflow, they'll probably get quite bored after a while because it's pretty much curves for anything fundamental. I use curves for so to match the lights and the darks. I'll use curves to match the colors. I'll use curves to create contrast. I'll use curves to dodge and burn. I'll use curves. But here's um, the thing: you could do so much with the fundamentals. And oh, I was watching yeah. Imad Awan's workflow the other day. He doesn't use too many different processes or tricks and techniques. Mm. He has he has a uh, a go-to toolkit that he uses over and over again. Yeah, and I think that's the same with any job. If you go to a job, every every day you go to that job, the dots say, right, we want you to do this in a different way. You yep. go there and you do the same, you repeat the process over and over again until you become a master at it. And that's pretty much like the, that. what the master painters would do. They won't come in and go, right, today I'm going to try and do 
yeah. use this brush upside down they'll just come in and use the same processes over and over again and eventually over time you, you just get better and better you at develop it. a system now i'm seeing some mm. really different methods being used for cutting out these um mice mices <laughs> yeah. uh yeah i've seen some where you just use a lasso and you you grab mm. like a rough outline this bit you're doing a bit of pencil yeah it, um, it, could you explain I, I and, a bit about that yeah i mean i try and my philosophy is try and do the easiest way first on the, on the everything so cutting out blending uh any sort of editing so i usually try the easiest way first and if that's not got a good effect then i'll move into using something a little bit more difficult yeah um so obviously this mouse here uh the the uh, way i cut out the other one wasn't working as good so i decided to use um the pen tool and then i would have gone in with a little bit of refine edge and probably just done okay. over the edge of the fur and now i'm color matching again using curves to color match that mouse into the scene okay so color matching with curves can you explain a bit about your process for doing that please yeah so basically when you go into curves you can pull down the color curves and you can go into the different color channels so you've got red you've got blue uh, and you've got green uh, so and then obviously the opposite side of that we've got you've got oh yeah i'm on the spot now what is it it's cmyk yeah. so it's cyan yellow and magenta so what you want and basically all those colors make up the color range in photoshop so when you go in say obviously that owl was too of a warm color so i had to go in and add more blues and uh cyan's into that owl to match it with the okay surroundings. and because there's a lot of newbies that are going to be watching this video as well as more experienced photoshop users can you just explain really quickly what an adjustment layer is and why anyone would want to use an adjustment layer so uh, an adjustment layer is basically a non-destructive way of editing and what does non-destructive mean it means you can go in at any point of the of the editing process and change it so i say if i use curves as my first layer and i did yep. some stuff on top of it and then i thought actually i need to go back down and change what i did in that first layer I can yep. just go back light in it or darken it still it's not a like in the old days of photoshop you would do something and then you would have to delete your layer if you messed or up or and... go undo 500 times yeah yeah <laughs> and for me, for me i have a certain limit on my undo so like yep. maybe 20 times and then after that that's it um, so non-destructive means you can go in, go in at any time of the process and just keep changing and adjusting things. And what's your preferred method for accessing the um, adjustment layers? I know there's different ways to do it. I like to use the little icon at the bottom of the layer stack. What, what yeah. What's your way of doing ac accessing? So I have these the adjust. If you look at the top of my layers panel on the screen yep. on the right sides, you've got the adjustment panel at the top. Yep. So if you look on there, you've got all, pretty much most of the adjustment layers on there. So I just use that pretty much 90% of the I, time. I see that, and I see other people use it, but I never access it using those icons. I um, think it's just quicker, and I think once you get to know the icons, you just you don't. It's like second nature. Yeah, yeah. My my um, Photoshop workspace is a lot more minimalistic than this. Everything's kind of flushed, mm. and there's maximum kind of screen size. But everyone's yeah. got their own way of doing things. Um, you've incorporated a moon into this. Can you tell me a bit of the story about this overall piece? Because it's not, Photoshop isn't just technical skills, is it? Mm. And... No, Photoshop's, it's, it, Photoshop's a tool what you use to tell stories, is what, how I would use it. Like, yep. as an artist or photographer, or even like commercial, a commercial um, photo manipulator, what, what you're doing basically is you're putting some kind of story onto a screen. So, like, before you even get into Photoshop, you need to know what the concept is, what you're trying to say, how you're going to say it. And then you use Photoshop as a tool to bring that to life. OK, that's cool. And what was the kind of theme that you wanted to Did you have any inspiration for this particular so piece? Basically this, or did this you kind... see another bit or? Yeah, so this was basically because it was shot in an old mansion in Yorkshire in York. Uh, we was kind of going for the kind of uh, playing with the heritage a little bit and also playing with fantasy a little bit and adding some surreal elements. Obviously, as you can see, there's a, we've added like a moon into the yep. image. And if you look at the top of her hair, you've got the reflection of the moon already there. And but that, that was because there was already a light source there, yeah? Yeah, but that is because I already went and scouted the location beforehand and I knew uh, I was going to shoot that model under that light. And that's how I knew I could quickly put a moon where that light was and it would all match up uh, And Clinton, instantly. 
for newbies watching this that, that are not photographers and don't have access to these resources, yeah. what what tips would carry over from this to what the guys watching the video uh, are doing with their photo manipulation work? How, how could they use the existing lighting in their fantasy scene? Um, I mean, it's just best to, yeah, it, every time I would usually start with a background first and then yep. I would try to manipulate the, the lighting on the model to match that background. Um, and when you're shooting your own images, it's a lot easier to, to do that. When you're using stock, it just it's a it's it just takes hours of searching through different stock images until you find ones with the correct posing. So would that be a tip lighting. for the newbies? Would it be to start with the background image, identify where the lighting is coming from, and then bring in your figure stock elements or your main yeah. focal point elements yeah, that, to match yeah. that scene, and that will make the process easier for them? Yeah, definitely. Always, I mean, you don't have to, but I would say always start with your background first, and then yep. the background has all the clues on there for you to then decide what model stock you want to use. Because with this piece, there was already a light source there, and you yeah. had the light source casting down the yellow hue on the top of the model's head, and you thought in your head beforehand, well, I can yeah. just remove that light source, add a fancy element, yeah. and have all of the lighting done in camera. As yeah, as yeah, were. definitely. So because that light was there i didn't even have to put put any lighting onto the walls or yeah. onto her because it was already coming from something what was the same shape as that moon and the same color so the artwork that most people on youtube is familiar with is highly stylized um kind of neon lighting and and deep red pink and blue hues uh, it's a style that christian bentalan favors everybody knows phase runner Benny Productions. It's in vogue right now, but yeah. this style here is more of a cinematic vibe, isn't it? Yeah, I'd definitely say it's more like it's got the kind of muted um, cinematography style kind of color grading on it. Yep. Okay. And with this style, do you think it's good for newbies to get their head heads around basic compositing and basic color matching prior to going ahead and blasting the image with? stylized overpainting yeah um and this is one thing i noticed quite a lot on instagram is that they've, it looks to me like they've put the elements in but they haven't color matched all the separate elements they've just put like some kind of uh color filter on top of it which it, it adds like a generic kind of color base to it but you can yeah. tell that the elements in the image still haven't been colored to the right color so even though it does it does maybe look like that everything is a similar color. It it does it's not realistic and it just doesn't um it just doesn't look professional. So what techniques do you use to match the elements? So I know we've been talking over a lot of this, but just just to as a reminder for all of us, how how would you for instance the owl, what process did you go through to match that owl to this model's lighting? So what I would usually do is I would bring it into the image, I would then go into curves. I would uh, play with the color curves. So I would add, obviously the owl, I probably probably added blue and cyan in. And yep. then I would then, once you've done the color, I would then do the tonal differences, so light and darks. So obviously it's a darker, it's quite dark inside there. So I would darken the owl down. But yep. then if there's a little bit of light coming from a curve and I would go over and brighten the side of the owl as well uh, using curves. You actually did a full video tutorial for us before about the full check process that you use. Yeah. And can you just explain really quickly what a full check process is? So a full check is basically a set of layers that help you, if you're doing composite or thought manipulation, help guide you to getting the right colors and the right tonal values and the right hues and the right saturation. And basically what it is, it's all your foundational uh, Thought manipulation techniques in one layer. So, say if I go in, if you want to make sure that your lights and your darks are correct, you would turn on the check layer onto black and white, and then you would look yep. at the image. So, it takes all the color away, and you're only now looking at the tonal range. So, if like you've got something what's too bright in the scene, once you turn, you'll be able to see it instantly, yeah, and, it, and it, it kind of stands out. Now, for you guys interested in this full check process, I believe there's a free action with it as well. I'm going to put that in the description of this video. So be sure to go and check that out if you're interested in learning more. Now on screen, we've got Dodge and Burn and you're very well known for your Dodge and Burn work. For the newbies, can you just explain a bit 
about how you use dodge and burn in photo manipulation work. Yeah, so dodge and burn is basically creating contrast in an image, but you can you can use that contrast in various ways. You can use the contrast to pull out detail. You can use contrast to darken and lighten certain parts of the air of the image to lead yep. the eye around, and you can also use it to add form to the to the body. So. Um, as you can see what I'm doing now, so on, when you get a, a, um, an object what's curved, yep. the highlights are always, on the part what curves out, that's where your highlight is, and when it sinks back in, that's where the shadow is. So if you can use dodge and burn to just enhance that effect, you get a more stylized 3D feel to, to your image or to your And, to your and it, does, it does have a very slight overpaint look, but without being too heavy-handed. Yeah, yeah, you can get the the painted look, and again, like you say, the more the more dodge and burn you do, the more painted it will become. Yeah, because this is already in that short amount of time that you've done mm. this dodge and burn process, it's already become a lot more um, stylized. Yeah, and that's that's just a mixture of dodge and dodge and burn and to the color grading. Okay, I and think. For the... Sorry, for the newbies, this uh, gradient map process, this is like global processing, yeah? This is applied to the whole image and you're yep. selectively adding and removing using the layer mask. I hope everyone watching today knows about layer masks and how to use layer masks. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's... I'll only use global colouring when you're pretty much right at the very end of the image. Yep. Um, you don't want... Before that, you just want to make sure the color, that all the elements match the background. And you do that by color matching every single element. You don't just want to place a global color grade over it and think, oh, that's that's done. Um, you, you need to take your time and make sure that everything is color matched before you do that. And why is this, this curves, um, this kind of dodge and burn process such a big part? I know you're a photographer uh, mm. by trade, but but what what is it about the dodge and burn look that the you gravitated towards and decided to um, use again this goes back to your, your influences as well so i would say as a child i i watched a lot of movies i also read a lot of graphic novels and i think that kind of sensibility from the kind of artistic uh, drawn and painted look what you were getting those graphic novels I, I kind of brought with me and then okay applied it to my own photography without probably knowing at first why i was doing it it's just i preferred that style of image for newbies that are really interested in creating fancy composites with their own artworks or um, you know their stock images, what, what's the what's the final tips that you'd pass on to anybody interested in creating work like this? Um, again, I'll try and even if you're creating fantasy, I would always try and find a little bit of realism. I think that's the main thing. Um, and just just to make sure that it, it feels realistic, it can blend together. If you can, if you can ground the image, then uh, with some cut with the rules of realism, you can still be as fantastical as you want. Um, it'll just be more realistic for the person to look at. Um, and, and I guess it, it, it all depends on your preferences as well. Um, again, I'm I'm kind of my influences come from cinema and from graphic novels so that's as you can see that's kind of where the my images tend to lead towards yeah absolutely well i appreciate you sharing the info with us today guys if you enjoyed this talk with clinton there's another one coming up right here that'll do it for this video thank you for tuning in see you at the next one catch you then peace